follow the Broadcasting Network, a divine voice out of Africa. Remember to like, to subscribe and to click the bell. Say amen again. Amen. Praise the Lord. The music today has been beautiful. I travel a lot. You don't always get music of this caliber everywhere you go, so I can't say any more than that. Uh, but that was beautiful. Um, if you have your Bible, you can turn with me to the book of Psalms, the 101st division. And um, I'm going to read the third verse as our scripture reading for this uh, talk, for our message today. This, this is not a typical sermon. I call these seminars. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of content um, as we go through them. Psalm 101 and verse 3 says this, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. A message this Sabbath is entitled, overexposed, the corrupting of a society. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. I thank you, Father, for your goodness and for your grace. Once again, Lord, I just ask that you make me a nail upon the wall, a rusty, sorry nail, Lord. But upon that nail, Lord, I ask that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Let Eric Walsh not be seen or heard. Instead, Father, let us hear a word from the throne room of grace. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to jump to the book of Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 14, and we're going to set this, uh, the information up today with this uh, Bible story, most intriguing of some of the New Testament stories are found in Matthew 14, um, and I'm going to augment that with a little bit from uh, Mark chapter 6. Matthew 14 and verse 1 says this, at that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus and said unto his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. When Herod heard about Jesus, he began to shake in his boots. He had wrongfully killed the Lord and uh, uh, the Lord's servant, uh, John, and he was so afraid of retribution. In order to to, to really make this plain to the readers, the gospel writers begin to explain the death of John. And there is a lesson for, a prophetic lesson for these last days as you follow this story. Verse 3 says this, For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. Mark will give you more detail on that in a second. But let's keep going with Matthew. Verse 4 says, For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. He called sexual sin by its right name. And the consequence of doing so was a death sentence. I want you to understand, because I'm doing a series at home on, the, on last day events and uh, some of the feedback um, we've gotten, some, some folk have come after me to say, you Adventists are crazy to believe on a Sunday law and that a Sunday law could transpire to the extent you say it could. But what the Bible and history both teach is that when you follow God's way, when you stand on principle, man will come after you. In this case, Herod is ready to kill. And it really was, as we'll see, his wife who wanted uh, John the Baptist dead. Verse 6 says this, but when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod, wherein he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. It was the entertainment of the night. It was the visual, musical, and intoxicating entertainment of the night that got uh, Herod to the point he gets to. I want to submit to you that Satan will use this same birthday party strategy 
in the last days to deceive God's people out of following what is right. Verse 7, whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. Verse 8 says, and she being before instructed of her mother said, give me, her, give me here John Baptist's head on a charger. I mean, they didn't even just want the man dead. It was, she wanted to make sure he was humiliated. To, have, to be beheaded was a, a most ignoble way to die. Verse 9, and the king was sorry nevertheless for the oath's sake, and them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given her. You see what happens? He goes beyond where he wanted to go, and he's sorry, but he's already given his word, and so they do it. And in verse 10, the scripture says, and he sent and beheaded John in the prison, and his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel. Can you imagine this young girl, beautiful girl, her wishes for a man's head on a platter? Can you imagine when they actually literally bring this head out and give it to her? She's traumatized. And now she has to take this and she brings it to her mother who probably gleefully accepts it because she does not, she does not want any reminder of her sin. She thinks by annihilating John the Baptist that her guilt and sin will be washed away. Ah, oh, for the last day church. The commandment keeping people of God, this will be the sentiment of the world against us. Verse 12, and his disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. Now, I want just to add some color to this, I want to add a little bit here and then we're going to get into the heavier part of this message. Mark 6, 19 says this, therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him. So this is just explaining what, why Herodias was really the, the one to blame here and would have killed him but she could not. She couldn't do it because the people thought he was a prophet and her husband fared John. Verse 20 tells us that. And for Herod fared John, knowing that he was, a, look, at, look, at the, look at how he describes John the Baptist. Look at how his murderer describes John the Baptist. Knowing that he was a just man and a holy and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Herod's relation, some people say, well, the Bible contradicts itself. No, it doesn't. It shows the evolution of the relationship between John the Baptist and Herod when Herod had him in a dungeon uh, where, underneath the palace. Herod, uh, Herod would go and visit John the Baptist, listen to his words, and as he got to know John the Baptist, he was moved by the Holy Spirit, and Herod, similar to Nebuchadnezzar, but may not have gone all the way, was moved by the Holy Ghost to understand the truth of the gospel. And what is interesting is that the Bible makes sure that he, just as it does for Jesus in the exclamation of Pilate that there was no sin that he found in Christ, it is the murderer of John the Baptist who declares his innocence. Tomorrow night I'll tell you my testimony and I, 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 one of the fascinating things was how when people, one of the things that never came up was that there was no one that I ever worked with for, no patient I'd ever taken care of, who ever said a, a, a word, that I had said even an unkind word to them. It was based solely on what I believed. Because I treated people very kindly. You'll, you'll hear about that more tomorrow night. Here's what the Spirit of Prophecy says. In Desire of Ages, page 220 to 221, Herod believed John to be a prophet of God, and he fully intended to set him at liberty. But he delayed his purpose from fear of Herodias. This should give you flashbacks to Jezebel and Ahab, right? Not supposed to be that afraid, brother. Here we go. Herodias knew that by direct measure, she could never win Herod's consent to the death of John. I want you to follow this, what S Sister White says here. And she resolved to accomplish her purpose by stratagem. On the king's birthday, an, in, an entertainment was, look at it, you see that word Ellen White uses? This is before there was a television. She uses the word entertainment. On the king's birthday, an entertainment was to be given to the officers of state and the nobles of the court. There would be feasting and drunkenness. Herod would thus be thrown off his guard and might then be influenced 
according to her will. I'm going to expound on this principle on when I do my seminar uh, Monday morning. But there, is, <laughs> there, is, there are those who are the enemies of the people of God who have a stratagem. Amen. They are working to strategize the destruction of the Christian church. She goes on, she says, When the great day arrived and the king with his lords was feasting and drinking, Herodias sent her daughter into the banquet hall to dance for the entertainment of the guests. There's that word entertainment again. Salome was in the, look at how she describes her, was in the first flush of womanhood and her voluptuous beauty captivated the senses of the lordly revelers. Somebody say Ellen White can't write. She can write. That's a, that's a, that's a powerful sentence. Some of y'all missed that. That's all right. It was not customary for the ladies of the court to appear at these festivities, and a flattering compliment was paid to Herod when this daughter of Israel's priests and princes danced for the amusement of his guests. Why were they so happy? Because she was one who was a descendant of the very house of God. I hope you're getting this. It wasn't simply that she was voluptuous. It wasn't simply that she was beautiful. It wasn't the way she moved her body solely. It was who she was supposed to be in character. Watch this. Spare the prophecy. Ellen White says, last part of this, the king was dazed with what? Wine. Passion held sway. And reason was dethroned. His frontal lobe was turned off. He saw only the hall of pleasure with its reveling guests, the banquet table, and the sparkling wine, and look at what she says here, and the flashing lights. Do you know lights have power? Watch this. And the young girl dancing before him, in the recklessness of the moment, he desired to make some display that would exalt him before the great men of his realm. With an oath, he promised to give the daughter of Herodias whatever she might ask, even to the half of his kingdom. That was some dance. I mean, I mean, I thought, I mean he, he was ready to give it all up. That's crazy. But it's, it shows you the twisted sickness that had entered Israel. We're studying it for our family worship, the, the Old Testament minor prophets. And there is this recurring theme of the sexual perversion of Israel. And one of the other themes, of course, is its injustice. When you look at this, you see that this man, this is his, in essence, if he's married her mother, this is literally his stepdaughter. There's no, he has no business lusting after her. And because of his, his inebriated state and his desire for pride and power, he makes consent to murder. Now, let me give you, I'm going to give you a couple of lists back to back. The first one is this one. How did Herod consent to murder? What got him there? The number one thing is pride. He wanted to show everyone else that he was better than everyone else. Pride. Let me tell you, that word has bounced around a lot in society. You know, uh, I think it's e Ezekiel um, a 40, uh, uh, 16 verse 49, which says, this was the sin of your sister Sodom. What was the sin of Sodom? The number one sin? Pride. You know, it's not a coincidence that there's a month named after that. Did you know that? Do you know that that, is, is not, the, the, that word being used is not coincidental? That is the sin God hates most. The sin isn't the sin that is acted out. The first sin is the sin in the belief that what I am or what I believe myself to be is more important than everything else. That's pride. The second one is intoxication. We'll come back to that entertainment, sexual atmosphere that was created. I'll, I'll show you a picture there. That's from a nightclub somewhere in the United States. Flashing lights. Ellen White even mentions the flashing lights, the idleness, a vindictive person scheming behind the scenes. This is what all lined up. Satan set up a trap to destroy God's prophet. The prophet that Jesus says, there's no prophet like John the Baptist. But how does it get us today? Number one, talking about being over, overexposed today, music. The music of our day is dangerous. Number two, visual entertainment. Number three, intoxication. There are a lot of ways to get intoxicated. And number four, an overly sexualized society. 
Now, let me show you prophetically how the devil has turned the world into a birthday party like Herod had. Watch this. Revelation 12 and verse 7. The Bible says, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. How much of the world did he deceive? The Bible says the whole world. Verse 10, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. And this connects you right back to John the Baptist, who had to sit in that cell and await being a, 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 a martyred. Um, it, even, even, it even shows that while he's in there, his doubt flares up. He has to go through his own Jacob's time of trouble type of experience before he is martyred. No glorious, nobody breaks into the prison for John the Baptist. The angel doesn't shake the gates open like he does for Paul. None of that stuff happens. And yet John the Baptist stays there and he allows that to happen just as will be towards the end of time the calling of the people of God. Look at verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath because he what? He knows he has but a short time. Now here's what's funny. We, if we're lucky, we'll live to see 80 or 90 years of age, and we behave like we have all the time in the world. He has been around for thousands of years, and he says he knows he has a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, look at what he does. The woman represents the church. He persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman was given wings of two great eagles, uh, 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 two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time of times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. There are a lot of ways people try and interpret this. We can talk about America and we talk about the, 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 the mountains of Europe, all the different ways. But God protected the true church in its small form during that time of the 1260 years. But look at verse 15. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. How does the, what does the devil do when he realizes God has a people who he cannot get to? He releases a flood. When you read the, the classic um, 1950s to 1970s SDA Bible commentary on this verse, what they say is that there are two ways that this happens. One of them is doctrinal deception. The other one is to flood you with worldliness. In other words, I, you can't get the church in its hiding place, so you try to lure the church out. I want to submit to you that that's what the devil's up to. That's what we're talking about today. This being overexposed. There is a modern flood coming out of the mouth of the dragon. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to show you the statistics that things have drastically changed. See, when I was a kid, we were poor. My mother was a single mother. And we had, we, 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 our, we never, even, you know, the cable, t, uh, color TV came out probably in the 60s. Uh, into the 80s, we still had black and white TVs. We had two TVs in the house, and we had a total of four channels. Some of you all remember this. I see you smiling. CBS, NBC, PBS, and NBC. Uh, I, I may have said one twice. Four channels. Our remote control for our TV was a pair of pliers because the knob was off, and you, had, you couldn't stick your finger in there and turn the channel. Sometimes my brother had to hold a, 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 um, a, a wire hanger to the TV so we could try and watch a football game or something, right? And when cable TV came, color TV, was, everyone else was getting it, and we pleaded with our mother, Mom, this is embarrassing. Get us some cable and some color TV. She said, stop it. I'll never do it. But you know what she did get us? Every two years, we got, or two, three years, we got a brand new set of Encyclopedia Britannica. That's what she spent her money on. That was Google back then for the young people, <laughs> right? 
Satan has changed his approach. When I was in Sabbath school as a kid, they told us television is how the devil is going to bring about the last great deception, how he's going to change the minds of the world. This is what he's going to use. I had some great Sabbath school teachers in junior class when I was a kid, and they said that. And you know what? I, in hindsight, I didn't, didn't seem like all what they were saying was that plausible, even though they gave us some pretty scary examples, like a TV show they used to call Fantasy Island. And they broke down a Fantasy Island. This is what my Sabbath school teacher told us, was actually designed to deceive Seventh-day Adventists. That's why it came on Saturday night after the Sabbath. And if you remember, they had demonic Baphomet showed up on the show, all kinds of crazy stuff. They were coming after us then, but they didn't have what they have now. Let me show you what I mean. So I like to use statistics to show you what's going on in the world. Look at this. This is hours of TV American households watch per day. Start in 1950, go through the 70s, and you see a constant escalation. Prophetically, something happens in 2008 that changes the course of this curve. It, it, it dips it down. What happened in 2008? The invention of the, and the release of the smartphone. The smartphone comes up and it changes the way we watch television. Let me submit to you that every smartphone, tablet, or PC is like having uh, the devil having the ability to release the flood in your hand. Now, let's, let's, look at, let's look at this a little more now. So, when you look at this one, this is estimated number of scripted original television series. So, this, this doesn't include um, reality TV, which is actually not reality at all. Just somebody ought to say amen. It is the most staged, stooged embarrassment to modern society. Now, watch this. When you follow this, look at how the online services, like Netflix, look at how they've increased over time. Why is this prophetically relevant? Because we just heard Satan's approach is to release a flood. By doing this, it is far more difficult to regulate what comes out on television. It changes everything because you don't need cable. Your child literally does not even need you to have a TV in the house if they have a smartphone. This has changed everything. And you can see the, the overall viewership when you add in these streaming services continues to go up. You see that, no, that 2008 dip no longer exists. Now, what else happens? The average daily media consumption per person worldwide, you can see that when you look at the blue, uh, the blue is the internet, the red is television. Now, so let's step away. The other two slides showed you America. This is the globe. I travel to countries that are less developed in the United States, and the one amazing thing I see is everyone still has a smartphone. You see how the flood happens? You see how when Satan comes as an angel of light and, and, and wants to fulfill the prophecy that every eye will behold him? You see how it can happen now? All you'd have to do is put it, stream it out on, uh, live stream it on Insta or on, on TikTok or something. Everybody would see it all at the same time. But this is dangerous. And from a, a, the perspective of a physician, public health person, it is dangerous. The New York Times. Now, and remember, the New York Times does not lean to the right of anything. But this is what they say. You are what you watch, the social effects of television. There's new evidence that viewing habits, look at what the New York Times says. Viewing habits can affect your thinking, political preferences, and look at the last one is the most frightening, even your cognitive ability. I hope you're getting this. We are learning that, and we've known this since the 70s, the studies have been out since the 70s, maybe even back as far as the 60s, television watching dumbs you down. It takes away critical thinking skills. Now, why is that relevant? I'm going to show you in a second, but let me, let me give you one more study just, just to, to show you one more thing that came out. This one, tele, too much TV may be bad for your long-term brain health. Look at, the, look at the quote here. People who watch large amounts of TV in midlife experience greater cognitive declines in their senior years. The impact of television, we often worry about how it affects children. We now know that if you become a couch potato at 40, it will increase your chance of dementia at 65. And we are overexposed. But it's not just, not just the visual media. One of the most frightening aspects is music. Now, I'm going to start with just giving you a Bible story to make the point of the power of music and the fact that all of our worries about physical and mental health 
are secondary to spiritual. Look at this, just three verses out of 1 Samuel 16. Verse 14, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Some people get, can't get this. They're like, well, how, why would God have an evil spirit? That's the devil. Remember where the devil would go in the book of Job? He'd go into the presence of the Lord. When he went out from the Lord, he went out from the Lord. It's the devil. The devil troubled Saul. Verse 15, and Saul's servant said unto him, behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Now look at, what, look at how they solve this problem. Verse 23, and it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, look at how they fix this, that David took his harp and played with his hand, so Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit did what? departed from him. Now, I want you to get this, church. If you can play an evil spirit out of someone with music, does it not make sense that you could actually play an evil spirit into someone with music? You see, music is different. It bypasses the frontal lobe of the brain. We're going to talk about that more in a second. It goes into the limbic system, the pleasure part of the brain. It can actually change uh, your emotion and mood in a moment. It can indoctrinate you because, because you don't use the frontal lobe to analyze what's coming in. Music allows the enemy to plant ideas and thoughts deep in your brain. Your ability to learn is five times better when music is being played. Did you know that? That's why you learn out your ABCs to a song. That's why what music is played in church matters. Satan, and if you go back to the second, I'm going to get off a little bit here, but if you go back to the Second Vatican Council and read the books, I bought it, I read it, one of the things that they tried to do was the encouragement that Christian churches would move away from the hymns to more modern forms of music. I call them 7-Eleven songs. Seven words, 11 times. Why? Because they teach you no doctrine. You see? The hymns are supposed to be, it's not, you don't just sing hymns because you worship. Remember that to, to, uh, the relationship with God is one where you know God, you trust God. Righteousness is by faith, and faith comes from the hearing of the Word. If you can learn better when you play music, that's why biblical songs, those uh, scriptural songs that they do are, are really powerful. But when the, the songs are sung in church, if they are not songs that actually edify All right, and this is all that we call entertainment. So look, let's look at a definition of entertainment here. Um, this is from Ann Bogart, who is a, a professor at Columbia University. She teaches how people to how to direct plays, and she's in a company called SITI, City, I think it's pronounced. But here's what she says. The etymology of the word entertainment is instructive. Enter from the Latin means inside. Tain is to grasp, to hold, look at this, to possess, occupy, or control. Ment comes from, the, from men's or the mind. Do you see when you put it all together what it says? It is to enter into your mind and possess or control it. That is what entertainment by etymology actually means. Now watch this. The word suggests the mental state of entering, holding, or grasping in between or inside. The word entertainment has long been associated with amusement and gratification. Look at what she says. But we can shift perspectives to find richer meanings and uses for entertainment. She goes on and she says, entertainment might provide the access to deeper parts of the human experience beyond gratification and towards insight. In other words, she's letting you know that from the academic perspective, this Columbia University professor, well-renowned play director person, is saying we can change your insights through entertainment. You know who knew that long before she did? The devil. He was the choir director in heaven. You read Ezekiel and Isaiah's description of Lucifer. He was built, what Bible says, with pipes and tablets. He is a living musical being. And he will use music and television as much as he possibly can to destroy our lives and our homes. Look it. I mean, and the science backs it up. That's what I think what's probably most powerful. That's Ann Bogart's the rest of it. I don't know if I clicked before. It's not just a movie. How television shapes our brains. Watch this. Television puts us into a hypnotic state. What does that mean for us? Did you get that? 
When you watch television, let me, let me, let me, let me, sh I'll show it to you here. But when you watch television, movies and television put us into a hypnotic state. Within seconds of turning on the television, our brain waves lower to an alpha state. And sometimes I give the talks on the different levels of the brain wave stages, but just know that that's the hypnotic state where you're awake, but you're not able to defend critically what's being, what you're viewing or hearing which is where we are most impressionable. And remember, these are not Christians writing this. This is not the spirit of prophecy. This is a secular scientist telling us this. The information we see or hear on the television, whether it's the news or a fiction film, works on our subconscious mind. What does that mean? What we believe, how we perceive the world and ourselves, our values and aspirations, all this can be reconfigured by what we watch on the television. It goes on to say in this article, now scientists know that these changes occur on a neurological level. Watching TV can change how much we use certain brain areas and how these brain regions develop, especially for children. For example, watching more TV can increase the size of the visual cortex and the sensorimotor cortices. However, it can also negatively impact, look at this, the frontal polar regions of the brain, which is associated with what? intelligence. In other words, watching television, and what if there's some studies that say when you, when, you, when you increase some of these other parts of the brain, it actually makes you more aggressive. The early studies on TV were done when shows like Leave It to Beaver and um, Father Knows Best were out. And even back then they found that children who watched a lot of television began to be more rebellious in their homes against their parents. That was when television was far more squeaky clean than the stuff on television today. And it still had that effect. It's pretty profound when you consider that what we have to protect is actually our frontal lobe. It is this part of the brain. And you notice what the study said? It is the prefrontal lobe that is turned off. Why does this matter? Because it is in your frontal lobe that salvation takes place. I don't have time to get into it, but if you laid out the human body, the body being the temple, and you take the sanctuary message and overlay it, then the frontal lobe is the most holy place of the sanctuary. It is where the Shekinah glory of God is supposed to fall. This is where uh, sin is dealt with, right here. This is why it is so important to protect your frontal lobe. The priest couldn't just wander into the most holy place whenever he wanted, could he? The priest had to wear special clothes. He had to do his special uh, rituals and washings before he went into the most holy place. And here's what's ironic. We just let anything into the most holy part of our minds. You know how important it is? The Bible says this about this part of your brain. Revelation 7, verse 3, I won't read all the three verses, just this one. The third one saying, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. It's not, it's not talking about putting a tattoo on your forehead. This is the frontal lobe. The human brain is 33%, one-third frontal lobe. The next smartest animal is a porpoise or a chimpanzee. Their brain is only 13%. And I know you think your dog is smart, but your dog is only 7% frontal lobe. He's still smart, but he does not have what humans have, the ability to reason and to worship. Why does that matter? Because when you go to Isaiah 1 and verse 18, you know what it says? Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Salvation is tied up in reasoning. And why else does it matter? Because this is where character forms. The only thing you get to take to heaven with you is your character. Revelation chapter 22, verse 3 and 4 says this, uh, talking about the new heaven and the new earth, and there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be where? In their foreheads. What does the name of God represent? His character. Are you starting to see it? We are learning that entertainment affects your frontal lobe. In fact, sometimes I talk about uh, pornography in these talks. I'll just mention it. Pornography has been found to actually shrink the brain and move you to a more juvenile state, the studies show. These are secular studies. Move a man from a more mature state to a more juvenile state. I bring this up because you're going to hear a lot this weekend about how does, do certain behaviors come into your lifestyles. So you say they're born that way. One thing no one has taken into consideration is that many children, before they have conscience, uh, the ability to consciously remember what they've watched on TV, have been exposed to things. And there are memory uh, uh, mirror neurons in the brain. You put a child down in front of some TV shows and they see things at two and three years old, we don't know how that might impact that child for the rest of their life. 
You remember the show Three's Company? It was supposed to be about San Francisco, a whole show. There was a guy on the show, Jack Tripper, I think his name was. And in the show, in order to live with two women, he pretended to be gay. So whenever the landlord came around, he pretended to be gay. We don't know what that influence that would have on a society as it was a number one popular show. Just him pretending. I, I want you to see the devil has released the flood. Here's what the Bible says. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 8. Speaking of how you got to protect your mind. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the what? The hope of salvation. Why is salvation? Three times in the Bible, Isaiah does it, Ephesians 6 does it, here it does it. Salvation is connected to a helmet because this is where it happens. And this is where the devil wants to get to. And so there is a war, a literal war for your mind. Here's what Spirit of Prophecy says. Adventist Home, page 403, Sister White says, those who would not fall a prey to Satan's devices must guard well the avenues of the soul. Look at how she says this. They must avoid reading, seeing, or hearing that which will suggest impure thoughts, that which will suggest impure thoughts. That's the off-color jokes, not even the hard content. She says, the mind must not be left to dwell at random upon every subject that the enemy of souls may suggest. The heart must be faithfully sentineled. Watch what she says here. This is a powerful statement. The heart, mu the, the, the heart must be faithfully sentineled or evils without will awaken evils within and the soul will wander in darkness. I hope you're getting this. Modern entertainment is worked to, 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 to stimulate within people evils that they otherwise would not have cultivated by putting thoughts and ideas into our minds. She says, this is letter one, 1887. She says, uh, Satan stands ready to infatuate the mind and soul to pursue a course directly contrary to God's express will that he may separate that soul from God and he interposes his temptations and gains control over the mind and the heart's affections. Look at what she says. She says, this is Satan's studied plan to lead souls to turn from one mighty in counsel to the persuasion of minds who have no love for God, no love for the truth. He wants your children keeping up with the Kardashians. He wants your children up on what the next Marvel movie is going to be. He wants them infatuated with the things of this world where God has no place. In fact, they are anti-Christian, anti-God. Now, let me show you what I mean by that. I'll give us a couple quick slides. You know, you look at, when I was a kid, the show Bewitched was on, T, uh, was on rerun by then. And it was the most innocent, sweetest, and prettiest looking lady and a nice home, but she was a witch. And I remember when I was a kid and my room was messy and my mother was coming home, I, I remember one time trying to move my nose and hope my room would clean itself up like on TV. <laughs> Praise the Lord that didn't happen, Amen. <laughs> But when we are young, we are introduced. This is Mickey Mouse from uh, the imagery from Fantasia. I'll talk about Mickey Mouse more in my, my testimony tomorrow night because that's one of the reasons they came after me because I talk about Disney. And I, I just have to be honest, I don't like Disney. I think Disney is the enemy of the cause of God. They have worked to lead more children into witchcraft and, and, and occultism and to follow their hearts rather than to follow God's will. So. But Hollywood has kicked in spirit. Look at Harry Potter, big thing. The, the lady who wrote it, J.K. Rollins, when she said the characters just appeared to her in her dream, she didn't even come up with them. Who do you think put those characters in her head? And their books came out, they do so well. I'm reading this book now. This is um, um, Children of the Beast um, by William Ramsey. I, do not, I don't think you should read it, I will, except I want to point out to say this, the book points to all the people this man had an influence on. This is Alistair Crowley, who was a, a big-time occultist, and, all, and it talks about all the people he had an influence on. Hugh Hefner, Playboy. I'll talk more about that in my seminar on, on Monday morning. It was his influence, his occult influence. Uh, Alfred Kinsey in the Kinsey Institute, which is still at Indiana University, which was a, he was a pedophile and a pervert that is still elevated in society. All goes back to the occultic movements of this man. Now, 
Just to show you, I, I won't stay on this too long, but just to show you, the biggest rapper of all time, Jay-Z, has his, the one um, law that, 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 that um, Aleister Crowley pushed, do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. You see Jay-Z with there on his shirt. John Lennon says the whole Beatles idea was to do what you want, do what thou wilt, as long as it doesn't hurt somebody. It was an occult movement going all the way back to the 60s. And you wonder why the world is in the condition it's in today. It's been generationally happening. Look at this. This is from Discover Music. The devil has all the best tunes, how musicians discovered their dark side. Let me tell you something. If you ever read Roger Murnau's book, A Trip into the Supernatural, you know these people cannot get this famous and wealthy without having sign, being signed off on by Satan himself. Some of the young people may, may know of an artist called Doja Cat. Somebody sent me some stuff from this woman dressed up like a demon, doing all kind of demonic stuff. It is very open and blatant now. It is a flood. In fact, this article, this article will blow, blew my mind. This is from Scientific American. Once again, not a Christian journal. The power of music, mind control by rhythmic sound. This is Scientific American. This is what people would run people out of church for when they come into church and talk about the, the, having to be careful about what music we play and what we listen to in church. This is from the article. The, this region of the brain processes the earliest steps in vision, the circuits that detect visual input. This means that our perception of the external world entering our mind through our eyes is affected by the rhythm of what we hear. Something seen at a point precisely in beat with an auditory rhythm is more likely to be perceived than if it appears out of sync with the rhythm. Let me, let me finish this and I'll give a little bit of an explanation. This gating of visual input by auditory rhythm does not require a prolonged uh, meditation on the rhythm to cause the person to enter into some sort of a trance-like state. The effects are nearly instantaneous. Within a few measures of music, your brain waves start to get in sync with the rhythm. Why is this dangerous? Because <laughs> There's been a battle in the church over drums. I won't get into that too heavy, except to say that when you syncopate the rhythm, the science now says you can put people into a trance-like state. And what that means is you can actually manipulate the crowd that way. The problem is, if you're not careful, you could be in church thinking you're having praise and worship and the demons are singing along. That's why Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 7, verse 5, it is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. Amen. You know what the songs on the radio are nowadays? Well, they, they've been for a while. They're a song of fools. You know how the Bible defines a fool? The Bible says, the fool says in his heart that there is no God. We have godless people, actually occultist people making the music our children are bobbing their heads to, going to sleep with, their, with those headphones in their ears, being inundated by the flood the enemy put out in Revelation chapter 12, being brainwashed. And then we say, what? I don't understand what happened to this kid. We raised him in church. But if all week that child is listening to this music, being inundated by the spirits of the enemy, all week playing with the spirits that have in, uh, uh, infestated this music, and then when it's time to come to church, they have no, uh, no desire to be in the house of God. Why? because the spirits they're familiar with are not present here. This is where the Holy Spirit dwells. And that's why this idea, when I was a youth pastor on the West Coast, they would always want to bring in Christian rap and Christian rock and all this stuff. I, that, I don't understand that. It was basically just a way to keep them, hold them in that kind of music until they went back to the real stuff. And what has it done? Well, let's see. What has been the impact of all of this entertainment? Well, one of the things, the United States, which population has seen an astronomical rise? One study I read that the fastest growing religion among a young, young, a teenagers and young adults in America is Wicca and witchcraft. I was in one of my clinics that I run, and I ran into a woman. I, they, they, I'd been in that clinic before, and they had a spell over the coffee maker that if you spin your coffee so many times and say something, 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 you'll have a good day at work. I almost went home and got my anointing oil and slobbered it all over the clinic. And I found out who's doing it. She had a pentagram thing on her neck, and I said, look at that. In, it, nowadays, they are, more, they are, in many ways, more proud of what they believe than we are. There's a meteoric rise. I was in London, and the, the, one of the pastors, I was speaking for the union office, one, I did like a, 
uh, 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 morning devotion for the pastors, and one of the pastors pulled me aside and said, in London, he said, we've found that for every Christian pastor in London, England, there are 30 witches. And they said every night, Friday night and Saturday night, the witches pray all night for the destruction of the Christian churches. I said, mercy, because you can't get some of us to pray for more than five minutes. This is what USA Today says, we are in the middle of a witch moment. Hip witchcraft is on the rise in the United States. You know what, you know what the, prophet, we, the prophecy we always believed is? That there would be three unclean spirits like frogs that come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the false prophet, and out of the mouth of the beast. That one of those three unclean spirits would be spiritualism. I am learning spiritualism is literally the glue, the end time glue, and entertainment is using it. And this sexual revolution that we're in now is really a, a rebaked form of spiritualism of old. Sex and sexuality, if you, if you are in God's will, in your sexual uh, living, if you follow God's plan, then you, you, are, you, are, you are honoring God in how you live in that realm of your life. If you go outside of that, you dishonor God, which means you are no longer worshiping God with that part of your life. That means you are worshiping the enemy. That's why these conferences are so important. Ephesians 5 says this, Verse 10, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Look at, what, look at what we are admonished by the Apostle Paul to do. He says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather what? Reprove them. Because there's a lot of churches that will say, you know, we shouldn't really mention this stuff. Don't talk about it. Somebody's got to reprove it. Somebody's got to say a simple, clean, thus saith the Lord in love. Because there's a lot of reasons not to get involved with this stuff. The world is being overexposed. David says, listen, Psalm 101.3, I read it earlier, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Is the entertainment sticking to you? Is it cleaving to you? Is it becoming a part of you? David says, I won't do it. Look at this. To show you the impact, this is from Pediatrics. This is the American Journal of Pediatrics, number one children's medical journal in the world, not Christian at all. Look what they say. Watching sex on television predicts adolescent initiation of sexual behavior. Why is the world so twisted when it comes to sex? This is the conclusion. So much I could have gotten from this article, but this is the conclusion at the end of the, of the, um, the summary of the article at the beginning. Watching sex on TV predicts and may hasten. Look, you see the word that these they use, hasten adolescent sexual initiation, reducing the amount of sexual content in entertainment programming, reducing adolescent exposure to this content, or increasing references to and depictions of possible negative consequences of sexually, sexual activity could appreciably delay the initiation of coital and non-coital activities. This is the American Journal of Pediatrics saying, you know what, Hollywood, slow down. It's too much. When you put this stuff in TV and in the music, it changes the way children live and behave. Now, so when you go back, you're going to listen to all this weekend, you listen to this conference, you're going to listen to our testimonies, you're going to hear, uh, uh, you know, especially when you, a lot of folks will say, you know, I don't know how people got this way. Let me tell you something. We have only begun to chip the surface of the influence that media has on the developing mind of a child to influence them to believe things about themselves, things about sex and sexuality. And that's not me. That's the, the American Journal of Pediatrics. But it's not just TV, it's music. Music's influence on risky sexual behaviors, examining, examining the cultivation theory. So now they're saying they have this belief that the music cultivates this. So when you hear these songs talking about all this heavy sexual material and children listen to it, they're saying they're being cultivated. Look at this. Again, secular people saying this. Of particular interest in the current study were the association between sexual content in music lyrics and videos and the dating and sexual behaviors of participants. Because participants in the current study reported listening to a variety of music rather than specific music genres, total exposure to sexual content across music lyrics and videos were used in analysis. So this is not just hip hop, not just pop music. This is all music. Uh, all you know, secular music, results indicated that sexual content via music lyrics and videos partially explained participants' age at their first sexual encounter, number of sexual partners in the past 12 months, rate of changing sexual partners, and condom use. Is that crazy? 
They can predict it by what they listen to and, what they, and the music videos they watch. Support for sexual content, exposure in music as a moderator between participant race, ethnicity, and risk, risky sexual behaviors were found for participants' age at first sexual intercourse. And it was worse, actually, for African-American children. They said maybe because they listen to more music, maybe the, 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 the stuff in the music is harder. They don't know. But what I want you to get from this is they're showing you that there's a cultivation theory. That when you listen to, you know what the Spirit of Prophecy says? By beholding, we become changed. They say, these findings support that of previous research in that exposure to music containing sexual content is associated with engagement in risky sexual behaviors. I hope you all are seeing this. Because when I was a kid, you know what we'd say at AY when they told us not to listen to music? Ah, we just listen to it. It doesn't affect us. That's a lie. Spirit of Prophecy had already told us it would. The Bible already told us it would. Now the secular science says, nope, actually, you, you can't avoid it. It affects you. It affects the way you live. It affects the way you, way, way you live. Now, here, here's the New York Post. Not everybody likes the New York Post, but I have to agree with this, um, this um, uh, um, um, article that they put out. China is hurting our kids with TikTok, but protecting its own with doyin. This is an um, article in the, in, the, in the New York Post. And look, I want you to see this because I didn't touch on social media much, but I want to show you that it is probably the most dangerous form of media we have now. While TikTok has become the most popular app in the rest of the world, a domestic version, uh, a domestic version called Douyin is available to Chinese consumers. The apps are nearly identical, but with one critical difference. I want you to see the difference. Users under 14 are required to use Douyin in, a health, in healthy moderation in teenage mode. There's no teenage mode on the American version of TikTok, just to let you know. So look at what it says. This, this is what the, the, the article says. Young impressionable users are limited to 40 minutes a day between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. They can't just do it all night to ensure they get adequate sleep. Endless zombie-like scrolling is interrupted by a mandatory five-second delays. They are also only shown specially selected inspiring content. You see that? Have you seen the stuff on our TikTok? It is embarrassing and oftentimes even dangerous and deadly. The algorithm is vastly different promoting science, educational, and historical content in China while making our citizens watch stupid dance videos with the main goal of making us imbeciles. That's from a former Air Force and Space. And she says, while American youth are performing hypersexualized dances and engaging in absurd viral trends like the deadly NyQuil chicken challenge, their Chinese counterparts are treated to a curated stream of videos promoting patriotism, social cohesion, and personal aspirations. You think the devil isn't going to use this stuff? Is it working? Well, it absolutely is. Here, this is sexually transmitted infection disease rates in the United States. Look at this. this is, look at it. Chlamydia has gone up. Look at how gonorrhea has gone up. We can't even treat gonorrhea the way we used to. This thing is affecting us. One of the things, I'll talk about Monday morning, of the sexual revolution is that they want you to believe there's no consequences to doing what you want. But the study, the science, what we're seeing is even during a pandemic when everybody's supposed to be social distancing, guess what happened? The sexually transmitted disease rates went up faster. I, I had a patient the other day tell me, what, uh, Doc, don't worry, I'm going to Vegas and what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. I said, not herpes. I said, that comes back with you. One of the biggest things that the entertainment industry is doing really is promoting the wine. The, the alcohol, the intoxication. The entertainment industry is an addiction in America. I won't go through these slides, I'll just mention quickly that what we are finding is that as they also show cigarettes, alcohol, marijuana in the, in the, in the movies, the TV, the music, it is also influencing kids to get into drug and alcohol use as well. It is a scary time. They have legalized marijuana everywhere. Marijuana works different than every other drug. It works on the postsynaptic side of the, of the dopaminergic system that causes pleasure, changing the very brain entirely. And the marijuana of today is uh, at least 10 times stronger in some cases than the marijuana that Bob Dylan and Bob Marley smoked. We are in a dangerous time of the devil attacking the mind. I want you to get that this, it is not, it, playtime is over, church. And kids are being overexposed by this, this um, demonic push to get our kids high and entertained, sexualized at an early age. And we are gonna to have to stand up and we're gonna to have to go back to, the, to, the, to basics with our families. 
We're going to have to remove some of this stuff, like my mother did. We're going to have to block some of this stuff completely out of our houses because you can't regulate it. The kids figure out ways around it, and we've got to be lifting up Jesus Christ and teaching straight truth. God loves them more than TikTok does. God has something for them the world can't offer. The world wants to give them fun and entertainment. The God of heaven offers them joy. Last slide is this one. Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. As my wife comes to sing the, the, the appeal song and closing hymn, I had a young man the other day come into my clinic and um, I was taking care of him and he was antsy in the waiting room. He's pacing the floor and uh, there's a, a wonderful West Indian young lady at, the de- at our desk doing the um, registration. And I heard her, overheard her ask him, does he go to church? And he was pacing and he said, you know, I, I don't, I, I've been looking for one. I, I need to find one. I've been looking for one. He comes back into the room I finally get him. He tells me about his sexual escapades. He's been really just out there sleeping around all the time, high on weed, high on alcohol, or drunk on alcohol. And I'm talking to this young man and I, and I say to him, I heard the conversation outside. What has that life gotten you? This tough kid, 20, early 20s, begins to cry in my exam room. And he says, it's gotten me nowhere. He said, doc, I feel empty like I'm just searching, and every instance, every engagement, every woman I'm with, every time, I'm hoping I find some sense of purpose. I mean, he doesn't say it quite like that, but I can't find it. I said, young man, God did not bring us together today on accident. I said, there's something that can fulfill you. There's something that can find meaning for you, and he began to cry. I said, there is meaning in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's purpose in him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. That is the secret to victory over sin. Don't look at your sin. Don't look at your past. Don't look at your failures. Look to Christ. By beholding you become changed. The more you look at your mess up, the more you look at your past, the more like it you become. But when you turn your eyes on Jesus, the more like him you become. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes 
turn our eyes towards Jesus. We'll focus on him, not on our past, not on our failures. We'll turn our eyes to him. Study his word. Call on his name. Trust in his promises. Father God, we thank you. Lord, for you have given us words of instruction. And in mercy and in love, Lord, you've offered us the example of Christ. Our prayer today, Lord, in a world that is overexposed, and as all of these avenues of entertainment are chipping away at the very fabric of society, Lord, we pray that as for all of us in our houses, Lord, we would serve the Lord, that we would turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face so that the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and your grace. Yes. Bless us, Lord. Bless our children. Yes. Lord, so many of us have children that, Lord, they come of age and they walk away. But Father God, you promised us in the book of Isaiah that you would save our children. Lord, we claim our children today. We claim the blood of Jesus Christ over them. Amen. We claim our families, Lord. We pray, pray for spiritual protection. And that, Father God, we would be in that number as now time comes is ticking down to the close of probation. Lord, let us stand in our lot following Jesus Christ whithersoever he leads as we head to the end of time. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Let the church say amen. Amen. And amen. amen.